Emotions part one. So we're going to start to look at a few presentations, looking into the role of emotions into what's been going on the last couple of years. And if everyone could just pop themselves on mute, um, just so we don't get any background noise. Okay, so one of the things that's really, as I was talking about the conference, is really to understand what behavioral science is. So behavioral science really allows us to do many things. And behavioral science is really the study of how we make decisions and why we do certain behaviors the way we do. And understanding it allows us to understand behavior, allows us to predict it to a certain degree, and it allows us to positively influence it. Now, behavioral science has got quite a bad name from the way it's being used, but it's pretty much like most sciences. It's really just having a deep understanding of something. And it can be used ethically, and it can answer many questions, but it has been used completely unethically. And it shouldn't really, and there's a lot of gray lines in here, but I think understanding behavioral science is quite key from just a high level, just to understand what's been going on over the last couple of years. And behavioral science has been used on the public by corporations for decades now. And it's got people to buy a lot of things they wouldn't normally buy or do a lot of things they wouldn't normally do. So I think I understand it brings a lot of power and free will back to us. So really what do I mean by don't get angry, get effective? So really in a conversation, if Jane and Joe Bloggs are having a conversation, if either person gets angry, it's really important to understand the conversation is pretty much over. So, you know, they both stand on their soapboxes and they project what's in the soapbox, which really is representing our unconscious mind. So all the reservoir of information, knowledge, belief systems, and that gets projected into the conversation. If Jane and Joe see things differently, then they're going to have different opinions. But if they get very emotional, that will shut down pretty much any chance. And there's reasons for that. And that's what we're going to look into today. And, you know, anger is one of the problematic ones we've got because Many, many people have a lot of reasons to be angry, particularly the science and scientists and doctors where they're watching absolute travesties. The problem is, is when they speak from that angry place, the very people they need to reach often get switched off. Um, so it's just really a practical element. I think we have to look at this. So really, it's important to understand the basic drive is to move away from pain and towards pleasure. This really is one of our basic drives in humanity. Now, obviously, you know, we can transcend that to a certain degree and, and consciousness does, but we need to understand what's going on at the basic level. So Joe blogs here, if he's shown that there's a virus and he thinks, perceptually thinks it's dangerous to him, he's going to want to move away from that and he's going to want to move towards safety. So that really is a key thing to understand. If you had somebody else and say they were young, fit and healthy and they didn't have the same sort of fear or pain associated with it, they would have very different behavior. So it's really how we perceive things that's key. So this is a slide I'm gonna show that we've done a, uh, this was the presentation we did at Brazil and we also did it last night at the World Council for Health, which can be viewed on their channel, the newsroom, which is really there's five elements that when we understand, we can understand at a high level, what is driving Joe's behavior. Assuming Joe, uh, believes the narrative completely and he's following as he's instructed. So Joe has been conditioned to think that there's a dangerous uh, virus out there and then he will have forces that he will respond to that virus and then he will have options um, and in this instance we're going to give two options comply and not comply and then he's going to have factors that will influence which pathway he takes. So we've really got five elements and understand these five elements, make it really simple at a high level to understand what's going on. So effectively, there's something that Joe is moving away from. It's the emotions and his needs that drive him to move away from that, to motivate him. If it was, you know, a very completely harmless virus to him, he would have no motivation to do much unless, of course, he was conditioned that it was, you know, to protect others, etc. But essentially, it's what Joe thinks about the virus creates the forces. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then what we have is Joe's perception of pretty much reality is then going to drive which pathway he takes. And there's going to be certain influences on those pathways. And then the comply and not comply really is the carrot and the stick. 
So when we look at these five elements, and it's really, you can see it's just a pathway. So Joe's going to move from the left to the right, and which way he goes is the key question. So today, what we're going to look at is number two, which is the forces driving action. And it's really important to understand this because most scientists and doctors I spoke to over the last two years initially had the thing, well, I'm just going to show people the facts and that will be it. And I think many people had a rude awakening that we generally don't make our decisions via logic. They play a large part, but it's the, it's the emotions that really drive the kicker to which option we choose. And of course, if someone's in a lot of fear, they're going to have a very different you know, understanding of the logic than if they weren't in fear. So forces driving actions, the emotions. So there's effectively three actions for emotions. The first one is to alert us really to make us aware that there's something that's threatening our safety or there's an opportunity. If we're walking along, say, in a park, you know, in an in a Asian country and there's just little friendly monkeys, you know, it'd be fine. But when all of a sudden, you know, a snake moves, it's really the emotions are there to alert us. There's something we need to take note of. Secondly, they motivate us to act. They really provide us with the sort of energy to know that we have to move, that we have to do something. And that's either to move away from something that's going to threaten us or move towards something that's going to provide us something. And therefore, the third thing of emotions is they really kick off bodily changes to prepare us for things. So such as fear will really drive this fight or flight to you know, essentially shut down the rational mind and send all the resources to the arms and legs to prepare us to fight or flight. And in some intense situations to actually just freeze. But essentially, these drive us away from pain and towards pleasure. And then, of course, the question is, so what are the role of emotions actually doing other than safety? And there's five basic things that emotions do. So one of them is that we have five basic needs and we, one of them is to be socially accepted. And you'll see with these basic needs why so much of the narrative was geared around the way it was. So socially accepted effectively in a lot of places, you've not been socially accepted if you choose not to comply. So that's a huge pressure that suddenly a need that you may have had before is suddenly not going to be met anymore. And this overlaps with the second one, which is part of groups. So we have a huge need in us to form groups, to communities, etc. And if suddenly you're excluded from those, unless you partake and do as the group needs, then obviously that's a big problem. And that's a real big pressure for a lot of people in that if you imagine someone's life is made up of certain activities and four or five groups, and all of a sudden they're told that they can't attend any of those groups unless they do something that they don't wish to do, a lot of people will cave in because a lot of people won't really judge the seriousness of the nature of what's going on and therefore we'll say oh, i'm just going to comply one of the basic needs we have is to influence others and make a positive contribution and of course this really i think overlaps with our purpose and this is the really key one this is to protect ourselves so if you know for instance you would have witnessed this so much over the last couple of years in that your behavior if you choose not to comply is actually conditioned to people to signal a threat to other people, which is why you'll see so much anger. So anger pretty much is an emotion to, to lash out at something that may be threatening us. And because of the way that we've evolved and that morality was only around 30 or 50,000 years ago, that prior to that, it was pretty much all primary threat, you know, whether a tiger approached us. But as we evolved, the brain started to use, you know, existing areas. So now, a threat could literally be, you know, not wearing a mask or choosing not to have a therapy or any other thing. It actually signals a threat to someone else. And what people will respond to a lot of the time is they will tend to attack or, you know, or run away from you and try to distance themselves from you if they feel threatened. And the fifth one is bond to partner, which is obviously quite key. And of course, those um, couples where one has chose to have a different outcome to the other has, has really split a lot of people in half. Um, and what's really key with these five basic needs is that a lot of corporations and a lot of institutions really understand this at a deep level. So what they're able to do is produce products and services that don't meet these needs. Now that may seem strange, but what they're doing is they're doing it on purpose because if you, if you kind of pretend to meet the need, 
what happens is that the person will crave the product more and more and more. So an example would be um, in nutrition. So nutrition obviously is to protect ourselves and continue to exist. And we have certain things where we're drawn towards sugar and fat to signal that there's nutrition in that thing. And what modern technology is able to do is to extract that sugar, put it into something else that has no nutrition, but we won't necessarily notice on an unconscious level because the unconscious mind is just looking for the sugar. And of course, what happens is when you, so if you think historically needs and wants were like a railway track because they're governed by two different parts of the brain. So whatever we needed generally was met with our wants, but history has now got to the point where you can have a want met, but not a need. And this leads to a couple of things, at least to false fixes, which is someone can get a temporary hit of something that they think is providing a need, but it's not. And of course the brain won't know the difference. So what it tends to do is it tends to turn up the volume and it turns up the request. So if someone was to drink a Diet Coke, the stomach would go, you know, you know, the sensors go, oh, we've got some nutrition on the way. And then the stomach would send a message up 20 minutes later saying, look, we got nothing. And then it would turn up the hunger, which is why it's shown that, you know, artificial drinks will actually uh, result in people eating more. And this false fixes is really through society as a whole. So when people need connection and socially accepted, et cetera, they're going on social media, but it's not itching that scratch or scratching that itch rather. So it's very problematic is that a part of the brain won't know the difference. And this is what leads to addiction. So Rat Park, which is a really video worth watching, was shown that people's understanding of addiction is not correct because it's really once the five basic needs are met, then people don't tend to get addicted, even if they try the, the substances. Now, the other thing is these compulsion loops. So the game designers have worked out that if you provide a certain want at certain times in certain degrees, you can actually create these compulsion loops, which, you know, if you watch anyone playing Candy Crush, you'll see it. And what you'll find is, in my opinion, is that they did this within the, the pandemic, is that they triggered this intense need for safety, but all the policies never met the need for safety. So they never made people feel safe. So whether it was two masks, three masks, four masks, two shots, three shots, four shots, lockdown, lockdown harder, people wanted stronger because once the brain is given a solution and told this works, if it doesn't work, they tend to turn it up. It's the same as if you're talking to someone, if they're not listening, we think we have to shout louder and that's really not the right way to do it. So effectively how this looks is, is that the bond between the wants and needs get broken. So the person never gets the need met. And this is why we have this problem is that people are not feeling safe, even you know when they have three, four jabs, um, but it's not very conscious to them. That's the thing about this. A lot of it's unconscious. And of course, so many corporations now understand this um, and products are sold just to meet the want because really a content consumer, as I mentioned, is uh, sorry, a content person is a horrible consumer. And that word consumer is obviously a very uh, dodgy word, in my opinion. So really understanding now that Joe effectively unconsciously is the key point is going to move from pain and towards pleasure. So the main function of fear and anxiety is to act as a signal of danger, threat or motivational conflict, and to trigger appropriate adaptive responses. So it's effectively, there's something here that I need to be aware of and potentially need to move away from. And that's why fear has been such a powerful um, weapon over the last couple of years to get people motivated to act. You know, you would have seen the leaked SAGE documents that pretty much referred to people are not suitably scared, so we need to scare them more. So now we get onto something that's really interesting. Uh, and this is actually quite a famous story from TFT, which was a precursor to EFT. Roger Callahan had been a psychologist, I think all of his life, and he was getting quite frustrated because he was having very little success. And what happened was that he had this client, Mary, and Mary had a water phobia and had it for I think 20 years to the point where she couldn't bathe she couldn't go swimming or in the ocean and she could literally have a quick shower you know under very uncomfortable circumstances now in 18 months of treating Mary he had got like nowhere to the point where all he could do was get her to sit you know 12 foot away from the swimming pool 
And then by accident, one day he had been studying, I think, acupuncture. And she and then he asked Mary, he said, how do you feel? You know, what does the water make you feel? And she said, it makes me feel sick to my stomach. And he says he doesn't know why, but he got a, he said, just tap under your eye because that's the stomach meridian. And she then ran towards the swimming pool. It was quite a, a miraculous thing that happened. And, and Roger sort of was quite scared because, you know, she can't swim. And then she turns around, she goes, it's okay. I know I can't swim, but I'm not scared anymore. Now, it's a very fascinating story. But what's really interesting about this is that Mary knows consciously that water is not dangerous. She knows that. She knows that people swim all the time. But that didn't stop her being scared. So effectively, the way to understand this is that there's an unconscious mind within us that if it sees something as dangerous, even if we know it's not, that might not make any difference. So really, so much of the messaging over the last two years has been talking to the unconscious mind. And there's, you know, I'm using sort of EFT for many years. We have so many stories of this um, in how people can change rapidly. But a lot of the time, they won't be consciously aware of what's going on. So really understanding the difference between the conscious and the unconscious mind is really key in this area, especially if we're going to look at people's behavior over the last two years. Because what you have is that the conscious mind, really, we will be experiencing certain emotions, but only that those that we're conscious of. Uh, we will have conscious ability to think and to question and to rationalize and compute. But really, the unconscious mind is a huge reservoir of all the memories, the belief systems, the emotions that are going on under our conscious awareness, and these primary urges. And these needs will be in that unconscious mind. So, you know, our unconscious mind will be driving us to meet those needs. But if we misinterpret how to meet those needs, we will then do things that may not meet them, but we think they do, and we'll continue to do them. So to be socially accepted, you'll see now that people are virtual signaling on Facebook profiles and all these things, trying to meet that need to be socially accepted, but it never quite works. So there's this constant change in, you know, from one flag to the next, so I've done this, so I've done that really to try and meet that need. The same with groups, they wanting to be part of the group. So they want in, you know, and this is one of the biggest drivers. So you'll see that even if Joe knows that something isn't right, it's really what the unconscious mind is driving him to do. And that's why the behavioral sciences had such a devastating effect over the last two years, because a lot of the communication is directly to the unconscious mind. So you could literally say to someone what the statistics are of them being at risk, but it won't matter if the unconscious mind is scared, just the same way that Mary was scared of the water, but she knows consciously she shouldn't be. And, you know, a couple of the things, and one of the other things that's really key is that a lot of people aren't even aware when their unconscious mind changes. So there was one, a uh, couple of stories of, um, I had a client in Sydney who was um, a, a kind of well-known business lady there. And one of my students at the time, said, can you come have a session with her? Because he couldn't get any joy. So I go along and I'm having a session with her and her boyfriend. And I thought they'd both willingly um, wanted a session, but it turned out that she'd bought a session for her boyfriend. Obviously, those of you that worked in that know that, that can be problematic. But so I had a session with both of them. And what's really interesting that with her, I had asked her whether she had any relationships from the past that when she thought about them felt very uncomfortable and she said yeah there's one guy from 10 years ago when I and I said when you think about him how do you feel she says absolute rage and I said on a scale of zero to ten she goes ten so she's literally when she just pictures this man she feels absolute rage so we went through a process of some of the EFT and various other things and then 15 minutes later I asked her to picture this man and, and what she felt she goes well I don't feel anything and I said see it worked she said oh it happened 10 years ago I obviously got over it she had such a lack of awareness that her unconscious mind had just changed in the space of 15 minutes that she had rationalized that, that had happened you know previously because it was just a time and it really startled me to realize, wow. And I knew from when I'd done NLP that one of the trainers, uh, Ian had said that a lot of the time when you resolve unconscious issues, a lot of the time the person won't realize. And he told a story where he had a doctor that had a fear of blood and he had managed to resolve it in an hour, but the doctor didn't think anything had changed. 
So this is really fascinating because people are having their unconscious minds manipulated by the stories and everything else, but they're not consciously aware that it's changed. So it's really, really fascinating how this works. And, and the session we had with her boyfriend actually went even better. And he was basically procrastinating on a business deal. And this really shows you a lot of the information in the unconscious mind will be from when we're eight or 10 or 12. We just learn something. So he was procrastinating. And when we got to the number of it, he said that he felt stupid. And when he said it, he cried. And he was sort of very uncomfortable at the time. And then we sort of cleared it up. And then I said, say I'm stupid. 10 minutes later, he said it. And he laughed. And that had just shown how the unconscious mind had, had brought up the memory, because a lot of the time it's memories. He'd processed it. And then he didn't feel the same way. And, and coincidentally which is quite a miracle i bumped into him that evening and he was on his way to the business meeting and it, it changed his view of, of what was happening so the conscious mind is always accessing what's in the unconscious mind so when what's in the unconscious mind changes our conscious understanding changes and this is the one of the biggest things to understand with having conversations with people is that you won't generally change their view consciously the information has to get into the unconscious mind. And that's why we use stories, metaphor, and questions, because that directly communicate with the unconscious mind. With the conscious mind, a lot of the time, all they're going to do is just tell you what they're projecting from the unconscious mind. And if two plus two equals five, that's all they're going to project. So just a quick example. Now we understand it a bit deeper in the, uh, an example of public speaking. So, I never literally, I can't recall a single client that I had come to me with a phobia that didn't come because their circumstances had changed. And what I mean by that, so public speaking, someone got a promotion or I dealt with an actor who got a promotion and then he had to fly somewhere, but he had a fear of flying. We generally move away from that, which we're scared of. Um, and a lot of people won't face them. And that's generally because we're moving away from pain and towards pleasure. But sometimes the forces of the circumstances change that mean that we have to face up to it. So if someone's forces do change and then they have to publicly speak. They've got two choices. They either go ahead and do it or they just avoid it and find a way of doing so. Um, and obviously the simplest way is to remove the phobia. But what you'll find is that people generally don't deal with their fears because of they move away from them. Because it's really interesting because if you said to someone, say they had a spider phobia, if you said, oh, we could resolve that for you, the conscious mind will go to the unconscious mind and say, no, spiders are dangerous. We mustn't take this away. So you'll see that the, the kind of, there's a safety catch. So if you're trying to talk to someone logically that they shouldn't be scared of a virus, you're going to find that that will have almost no chance of working if you talk to the conscious mind. And this really explains a lot of what's going on in that, you know, there's this, it's this difference between conscious and unconscious that's really key. The one thing I think that's really, really important around having conversations and, and communicating is literally how we see ourselves. So if we think about, Joe and Joe, how he has a picture of himself, what you'll generally find is the reason that they use in the mind space document, which is that government document, you know, showing how to influence people through public policy, is they play a lot on the ego because how people see themselves is very key, which is why that um, they did a medical study, a uh, scientific study to work out what would be the most effective messaging to get people to comply and they used guilt and everything else because what you'll find is with something like guilt guilt is a, an emotion about a behavior now if you say to someone you're selfish if you don't do this what you generally find is that they will change the behavior to match the self-image so then we have some interesting things that come up um, which is one is shame versus guilt now, they look like quite similar emotions, but actually they're quite different because guilt is a behavior of something that someone's done and shame is really at being something. So well, the reason they use shame and, and, you know, and those kind of selfish emotions is they hit an identity level. So, you know, people do not want to change their identity, even though it's possible to have that influence. So a lot of the time they will change their behavior to maintain this ego or identity. And that's why the media push so hard to say, if you don't do this, you are not a good person. 
Yeah. And of course that is a huge pressure. And I've, I've watched videos where somebody is asked whether they're going to get a booster shot. And she says, Oh, once I recover from the, once I recover from the adverse reactions from the last one, and it's like, wow, that behavior is pretty dangerous. But she then said, I couldn't stand, you know, if I was to hurt, harm one of my loved ones. So you'll see that that's such a powerful force that's driving people, even if none of the logic makes any sense. So in summary, what's really key is to understand that strong emotions shut down the rational mind. So effectively, when we go into fight or flight, we can't think clearly. So when you trigger anger and etc. in a conversation, um, this is why it has such a detrimental effect, and particularly around the amount of times people have said to me, I, I know what I want to say, but I get into a conversation and I can't remember anything. Now, that's not personal to you. That's us as humans. That's the way our brain works. You can't experience strong emotions and think logically very well at the same time, which is why dealing with emotions is very key. Emotions literally distort perception. Mary's example of being scared of water literally distorted her perception. And I had an example of this when I was in Rio. So I, I used to have a height phobia, which I'd pretty much, you know, is gone. But there was something about being up at the Christ Redeemer that sort of triggered a little bit of it. And I kind of felt in my mind, I was imagining the thing falling over. So what I did was I just stood there and, and worked through um, one of the techniques I know. And then the, all the emotions disappeared, but I could really feel it in my stomach, my chest, all these things. And it's literally the unconscious mind is just going, look, there's something we need to be aware of. And all I did was say, you know, just really relax and talk to my unconscious mind to say that, you know, there was nothing to be scared of. This third part, I think, is one of the most key things we're starting to discover a lot more about now. And that's people in different moods will have trouble listening to your message. Effectively, what the marketing shows that if they present a advert, which is in, say, a very upbeat mood, but the audience is, say, in a very downbeat mood, say they're watching a horror movie or a sad movie, it won't land. So what you're, what you're seeing is there's just a mismatch. So if you think about how this, and this is a kind of theory that I'm working on at the moment, if you have someone that's very scared, what are they going to be seeking? They're going to be seeking safety. Will they want to listen to someone that's angry? And I think no, because I think anger signals threat. So I think what you'll find is, and I was talking to one of the scientists about this, is, and he said, yeah, it makes perfect sense because, you know, a lot of the scientists and doctors and all, a lot of us have ample reasons to be angry, yeah, and to be frustrated. But the people that need the message are scared. So they need a calm voice. So what you get is a lot of these politicians getting up there and speaking very calmly, you know, providing their wants. And I think that's one of the real reasons that's going on. There's this kind of we move towards what we need. Um, so just a quick, you know, how do we resolve our emotions? So there's many, many ways. And obviously we have a call on Tuesday night, which Rebecca runs and she's here um, on EFT. Um, and of course, EFT Universe is a great site uh, with the science. A lot of the science data is on there, how EFT works. Uh, I also like the Sedona method. That's very good. Uh, letting go is pretty good. Um, and also the holotrophic breath work is really good. Breath work gets at a really deep level. But all of those are great ones to use. Obviously, we use EFT on a Tuesday night, which there's a call that everyone can attend. And it really is that if you want to have a good conversation with someone, the emotions are going to be one of the biggest blocks. And I spoke to people about what I did in the early days, because I had all the anger and, and the various emotions, frustration, and I would literally have an online conversation and I would tap whilst having it to the point where I didn't feel any anger. And it didn't matter what people called me. It didn't trigger the anger at that point. So resolving emotions would be very, very key. We have to understand that you will naturally move away from doing that. So you've almost got to be very conscious that, and, you know, to allow yourself to, to resolve these. And really a key is emotions buried alive do not die. Really, really is key that we can't push them away. They're, they're there. Of course, just like Mary, you know, with Mary, it's obviously very problematic because water's everywhere. But a lot of the fears we will have won't generally come up that much. And it's a bit like having a a front garden with loads of landmines. Each landmine you release, you'll get more energy back from releasing the emotions, but you also 
will react very differently in situations. So one of the other ones I had was, you know, not wanting to confront the police, etc. So I did a number of tapping on that. And then when I went to the various marches, I would happily go up and talk to them. So it's really to understand when you see someone doing something, there's a good chance that they've not always done that. You know, there's a good chance that they've obviously resolved an issue. So reachingpeople.net, the three main targets for us are conversations, messaging, and how we're influenced. Uh, plenty of uh, videos on the website. Uh, if you do want to support us, thanks to all, the, all those that have, um, you can do so here or you can attend one of our paid events, which is, um, there's one coming up this Saturday, which is how the pandemic was sold, um, which has had a lot of good feedback. And that's showing us the 10 main ways that we, the people of public have been misled.